Actually, you know what I got to do? I got to press the record button. There we go. All right. Now we're official. We are live. Uh, welcome to Business Without Social Media. Can we thrive in business without social media? That's the question we're here to answer today. Uh, I'm going to share in this session, I'm going to share my story, leaving social media seven years ago, 18 different relationships-based marketing strategies that I have consistently learned and implemented to grow Magic Media and now Magic Kids. These are the same strategies that I coach people to implement in their businesses. These are the same strategies that a lot of our partners at Magic Media also implement. Hopefully, by the end of this hour-long journey, we're going to go on. Y'all are going to have some clarity around things that you could be doing that don't suck your soul into the Facebook algorithm and allow for you to spread your wings and fly in the world to have more time to do the things that you want to do. That is the whole purpose of this. That's why I left social media. And I'm, well, I guarantee you're going to walk away with some stuff. So have a notebook ready. Be ready to take some notes. Uh, if you have questions, I'm going to do questions at the very end. I want to get through the whole shebang here. So if you do have questions, you can throw them in the chat, but copy paste them so you can put them back to the top of the chat um, once we get to that section of the adventure. So away we go. I'm going to share my screen and uh, hopefully y'all can see what I see. Okay. Can you see Thrive in Life and Business Without Social Media? Beautiful. And are you ready to begin your freedom adventure here? Set yourself free. So uh, I guess I didn't introduce myself. I'm Bradley Morris, for those of you that don't know me. Um, and uh, I'm just curious, why do you want to set yourself free from social media? Share in the chat. What's your reason? Why do you want to escape the social media matrix? For me, the, the reasons were clear. Share in the chat. Let me know. Uh, oftentimes I hear people aren't getting the results that they want that it's a lot of time and energy pulls them away from the things they want to do. What else? What other reasons do you have? A lot of people who saw the social dilemma realize just how uh, crazy and corrupt this whole game is and how it's rigged to hold our attention, not necessarily help us connect with friends and family in the ways that it was once sold. What other ways? Were your reasons for wanting to escape and take back your time, take back your creativity and your energy? Nice. Not been on for 10 years, but then started managing it for my husband's company about nine months ago, then got my own for my real estate business. Don't see it creating actual benefit to my business. True story, probably. I don't like have to rely on an algorithm. Yeah. We don't want robots deciding our fate. We want to decide our fate, right? Hopefully, unless they're really friendly robots, of course. But I don't know if these are the best intention robots. Um, so for me, the reasons were really clear. Uh, it was sucking the life out of me. Uh, seven years ago, as I said, I left and I had a moment. Uh, I'd been planning to leave social media for three years before I left. I created a group on Facebook that was called uh, Evacuate Facebook. It was slowly gaining momentum of people trying to figure out like, what do we do outside of this matrix? And then my son was born in June, 2016. And I had this experience sitting up on a mountain, watching the sunset. It was a beautiful moment. And, you know, reflect on having this new son and we were building this new branch of our business, the Great E-Course Adventure, which is kind of like a course that's like Saturday Night Live meets Indiana Jones in a business training. And it was a really exciting chapter. And so I'm watching the sunset. I'm feeling a lot of emotion and gratitude. And then it happened. My brain started to think about the post that I was going to write later on Facebook to describe the moment I was in. And doing just that, I left the moment and it was in that moment that it was very clear to me that my thoughts were no longer my thoughts. They were Facebook's thoughts and it was very clear my brain was hacked. This was not my brain anymore. Facebook owned my brain. I was literally wanting to post my experience and uh, that was disturbing to me. 
I, I did not like the feeling I had after having that realization. And I went home. I said, I'm going to leave. I made a post and said, I'm going to peace out everybody and grab my favorite contacts, got their information. And I left the next day. And that was scary because I had a baby. Social media marketing was the main way I was growing an audience for the previous probably eight to 10 years. And uh, I was a daily poster. I was an avid user. I quit cold turkey. <laughs> and, uh, and that was really scary. And so the reasons for me, if I was to summarize them, were rather than connect us, social media divides us. I mean, it's even more clear now that it divides us rather than connects us. Uh, rather than being inspired, we feel more anxious by using these tools. Rather than building friendships, we get followers. And when we really think about that, it's kind of a twisted uh, way of going about business and going about life. Rather than creating more connection, we have more loneliness than ever before on the planet. The suicide rates are higher than I think they've ever been historically. Rather than feeling safe to share our thoughts, we censor them. And now with censorship, they're censored for us if they're not the right ways of thinking. So that's not a good thing either. And rather than being free, we become addicted to our devices. So these were the main reasons why for a long time I wanted to leave social media. Being an entrepreneur, um, that was a scary leap that I had to take. Leaving was strange. Uh, I'll describe that. Leaving was like being erased. And I think this is the main thing, the main reason why most people don't leave social media is because who wants to be erased? Not a lot of people. And I had built a following. I was regular. I had a lot of friends and connections and studios and people that were following my work and inspired by my posts and all the things. And I could have just kept doing what I was doing and doing my several days or several posts a day. But it felt weird. I got out. And the strangest thing was uh, nobody called me. I wasn't getting party invites. All that happened on social media. My friends didn't start calling me and say, hey, dude, I saw you left social media. What's going on? Nobody was texting me. I wasn't getting invites. It was like literally, you know, we were th our third year on Salt Spring Island where I live now. So it was like we were new to the community. I didn't have a large, fr large friend base here. We had a new baby. And it was a very, very eerie feeling of like 10 years of investing into all these online relationships. And now I have no friends. This is really messed up. That was, it was like, what social media did for me is it created the illusion of a community. And yet if I was sick, if we needed a meal train to come feed our family while we were raising our new baby, the people on the internet were not gonna bring me food. The people on the internet were not gonna support my family and I. And it was a big wake up call for me. And it was that that inspired me to want to invest locally in building a real village around my family and I. Uh, my wife created uh, a group of moms, which is now seven, eight hundred moms and grandmothers on our island. And so that's become this incredible ecosystem of support and community. And, and then I built uh, a crew, a men's group on my island called Man Ventures. And, and we've, Five and a half years now, we meet every Tuesday. Whatever guys show up on Tuesday, decide what the adventure is the following week. And we can't do the same adventure two weeks in a row. And it's become this incredible hub for fathers and amazing men to come together. And we get to experience all these amazing different things together. And it's been a beautiful way to grow village. When a dad is going to have a kid, we'll do a work party. We'll chop their winter's worth of firewood. We'll bring food. We'll plan meal trains. Uh, we've done, you know, barn raising parties. There's a family who's uh, house burnt in the last month. And so we're planning a, a barn raising party for them to help them build a, a space to live in for the winter time while they build the rest of their house. I really came to learn what community is, uh, both online and, and in person. And that was a, a transformational experience. And it was also really, really difficult. But the moral of the story is, is what I've come to learn is that the world does not need more social media or better social media platforms or improved algorithms. What we need 
is more social connection. Even though we're online right now, we're all live. This is a live experience unless you're watching the recording. And this is a form of connection, uh, which is a little bit better than just posting on a wall. So the first question I have for everybody this year watching or listening is talking about return on your investment. So we're entrepreneurs, we're business people, we're trying to make money by doing our passion. It's really important to watch the numbers as they add up. So first question is, how much time do you spend on social media? This includes scrolling, watching, posting, thinking about posting, commenting, responding to comments, instant messenger or messenger, whatever that thing is that Facebook has for sending messages. How many hours per week? And you can share in the chat. There's no shame here. It's really important to just kind of get an idea on that so that we can see where our time goes. Uh, I would say the average, this, this workshop, I've talked to over 3,000 people in the last year, and the average is roughly somewhere around 10 to 20 hours a week of social media time. So that's 40 to 80 hours per month. You get really damn good at the guitar if you spent 40 to 80 hours a month on the guitar. You could do a lot of other things with 40 to 80 hours a month. And most people that I meet are like, I don't have time for anything anymore. And when you look at those numbers, it's like chances are you might have some time. So the next question is, is like, how much money are you generating from your time on social media? And hopefully you have some form of way of tracking the hours invested in and the money that's coming back from clients or sales, products, trainings, et cetera, all the things that you're doing on there. So knowing the money, can you even track it? Is it $0? Is it less than $500 a month that are coming from time on social media? If it's, you know, is it, are you make are you crushing it? If you're crushing it, then keep doing what you're doing. Cause some people have figured out a way to make social media work for them. And if that's you, you're going to get some other stuff out of this workshop, but it may not necessarily be for you. This is for the people that are like tired of social media sucking their souls dry. So everybody's going to have their own amount of time that they've been putting into social media. Let's just pretend it's 10 hours because a lot of the time it's slipping away. The third question is how much fulfillment does it bring you? You know, on a scale of one to 10, 10 being you love it so much and it fills you up and you feel inspired when you're on social media and you love the connections it creates. And, and it's like, it's a part of your lifestyle and you dig it. Zero or one being like, you hate it. Like you could literally, if you knew a way to, to walk away from it today, you would. So where are you on that spectrum? Because it's really important. You know, Amy says one. Great. That's really good to know. Hopefully uh, you're going to learn some stuff that inspires you. Uh, we got another one here. Great. So that's pretty common. Most of the people I've taught this workshop to are like less than a five out of 10, which is kind of telling. It's like the majority of the world is on these platforms. The majority of the world's connect there. And yet the majority of the world hates it. What's up with that? It's so strange. It's so backwards. It's like, we feel like we have to do it because all the online marketing people said we had to do it. So I'm here to today to tell you, you don't have to do it. So next question, this is the really important one, is like, if you walked away from social media, there's gonna be a big gap. You're gonna have a whole bunch of space. And what happens, space is like a vacuum. What, what it does is, is you gotta fill it up with other things. So let's just say you had 40 hours per month extra because you stop posting, commenting, liking, thinking about social media, scrolling that damn wall endlessly. There's no bottom to the wall. Like you could literally keep going forever. So let's just say you walked away, you got 40 hours back. What are you going to do with that time? What, what relationships would you invest in? What skills would you start practicing? Would you learn an art? Would you do more art? Would you read more? Would you guard more? Would you go on more adventures? What are you going to do with all that time and space? It's a really important thing uh, to think about is like, what are you doing with that? Because you're not going to leave unless you have a big enough why. And chances are the things that you're going to pour into that space that you get back, that time and energy you get back, that clarity, that mental space, those are your big whys. And don't worry, everybody. There is going to be solutions that, that I'm going to be laying out here on how you actually walk away and, and grow your business. So for me, seven years later, I have more time for rest. My work hours are six hours instead of the nine to 12 hour days. 
more time for adventure. My company has made more money year after year since leaving social media. Without it, I play professional golf as my hobby. I golf six days a week at sunrise. I exercise. I get more family time. When I finish work around 3.30 every day, I'm on dad duty and I go on all sorts of dad ventures with my kid. It's a beautiful life. And I don't need to post about it on social media. That was one of the habits that felt really strange when I left social media. It's like, who do I share my awesome life with? Oh, I just keep it in my heart. It's for me. Oh, I don't have to tell everybody how good my life is. I can just experience it and enjoy it and go to bed feeling like, well, that was a cool day. Nobody needs to know. It was a really weird flip of the mind. So now let's get to some solutions. How do you build a business without social media? How do you succeed? How do you win the game? How do you grow your audience, your impact, your income? That's a really good question. So every year I pick a word that themifies my year on New Year's Eve. And the two years after leaving social media, I chose the same word, same word, two years in a row, because it was a really important one. And the word was relationships. What does it mean to be in relationship with people? How, how do we be in real relationship with each other? And this was the quest I had to go on. This is why I started the men's group. This is why my wife started her collective. This is what my entire business model has been built around is cultivating real relationships with real humans. And the strategies I'm going to lay out, you can be a successful entrepreneur with instead of 10,000 followers or 10,000 on your email list and 100,000 or a million followers on social media, you can literally build the lifestyle that you're trying to attain for yourself with a handful of relationships. You just have to understand how to leverage relationships and how to work together. And that's what we're going to get into here. So I'm going to share 18 marketing strategies that don't require any social media time and space now. And these are all ones that I have used over the last seven years and use on a regular basis. So this is the fun stuff. This is the solution time. So write down any notes that pop in your brain as we go. So the first one, this is the most obvious. Everybody needs an email list. Your email list is your direct line of communication with your people. You own your email list. You can print out a CSV file. You can put that in a spreadsheet. Nobody else owns that email list but you. So your email list is the direct way of communicating with your people. If you have an email list, then love them up every week. This is like your pen pal. These are your people. They care about you. If they ask to be on your email list, they want to hear from you. So don't feel like you're bugging them if you send them an email every week. I send my Magic Media email one to two emails a week, and I try to provide as much value as possible. I send my YouTube videos, my podcast episodes, articles, coaching stuff, invitations to come to events like this. I try to do everything I can to to share value with my people. If you're one of those people that built an email list and then it's been cold for six months to a year, stop that. Reach out to them and apologize. Beg for forgiveness that you haven't reached out. This is a real relationship with real humans on that email list. They're not leads. They're people. And those people care about your work. That's why they subscribe. So send them an email today and tell them you're going to improve and ask them how you can help them. Ask what's up in their life. I literally send out emails once in a while if I don't know what to write and be like, hey, send me an update on your life. I'm the one doing all the talking here. And then I get a bunch of people sending me emails and that inspires a bunch of creative new ideas on things I can make for them. So be in a two-way conversation with your people. Email them regularly at least once a week. If you don't know what to say, ask them questions. Number two, design a signature workshop. Anybody who is a coach, a creator, you're a teacher, you have things that you want to share. You have things you want to educate people on. What you're in right now is my signature workshop. Welcome. I've toured this on 12 stages this year. The 60-minute workshop in the last 12 or so months, 12 stages, over 3,000 people have joined my email list as a result of this. When was the last time 12 hours of social media time led to 3,000 email addresses in your inbox without spelling, spending a fortune on social media ads. Chances are you have not had that success. <laughs> signature workshops are awesome. You craft a signature workshop. This is like, I always talk about, it's like climbing a mountain. Your signature workshops, like your, your life's works like climbing a mountain. Your signature workshop is base camp. This is people's first experience of you, your work, your philosophies. 
And then from there, you call them to adventure. And that's, you know, they buy your next program. They join a train. They join a membership. They come on the adventure with you. So, oh, what are you seeing here? You don't see? Yeah, we're still on that slide. I'm just explaining what the signature workshop is. We don't, thanks for the tip. I'm going to add the mountain visual for the next one. So the, the signature workshop is a 60 minute live workshop and you tour that from virtual stage to virtual stage. You try and do one to four signature workshops per month. So everybody's talking about like, go do a podcast tour. But here's the truth about podcasts. And I'm sure you can all agree with this. People listen to the podcast. They get inspired by it, but then they move on to the next podcast. Rarely do people listening to a podcast go to the guest's website, sign up for their email list and start buying their stuff. Podcasts are like, they're nice and they're fun. The better purpose of a podcast that you go on is to like, you book somebody to host you for a signature workshop. You go on their podcast one or two weeks before the signature workshop and the podcast episode warms their audience up to you so they're more likely to come to your signature workshop. Your signature workshop is going to be the place where you like give people, you share your story, your philosophy, that creates resonance. It's like the sorting hat in Harry Potter where people can identify themselves as your people or not your people. And then you give them their first breakthrough experience. The majority of it is like, you're going to give them some form of shift. They're going to have a breakthrough. They're going to transform. They're going to walk away feeling changed and like they're on starting a new path in their life or on their journey. And then at the end of it, you call them to adventure. So that's where you sell your coaching or your training or your subscription, whatever you have, your audio library. There's all different types of things you could do. Signature workshops. In my 19 years of entrepreneurship, this is the simplest, most scalable marketing strategy I have ever discovered and I've tried all the things. And so unless you've got a giant budget that you can pour into ads, I would go with this. Next, nobody's talking about this, uh, licensing. So between 2009 and 2012, I taught about 500 meditation workshops. I did retreats around the world and I got pretty tired of doing that. So I started building an audio library from 2012 to 2014. Uh, my buddy and I produced 48 meditation tracks, each with custom composed music. We were going for like, the goal was like, let's create a world-class audio library. We did that. I've licensed that library to about eight different apps. Those apps pay me monthly, quarterly. They've outright bought my meditation tracks and uh, I get licensing royalties. I've generated hundreds of thousands of dollars from my meditation work. I haven't had to build an email list. Uh, my licensing royalties keep coming in. Uh, income keeps growing every year. I've reached several million people through these different apps that I license to. And I've been a retired meditation teacher for quite a few years. And so if you are producing audio assets, if you're creating online courses that could be evergreen, you can license those to institutions, companies, apps, etc. And if you do that non-exclusively, you can license the exact same content to many different platforms. So, I mean, I work with a lot of people. I just finished uh, business with uh, the business of meditation training. And so we had a whole bunch of meditation teachers in there. So train them to like produce really professional audio content and then license that content. And it's a very simple strategy for getting your work out there so you're making the impact that you want that fills you up and makes you feel like you're doing the thing you're supposed to be doing on the planet, but also generates more and more income as you grow your audience and grow that audio library. And once you get your foot in the door with an, uh, with an app or a platform, they're going to be looking to you to keep submitting more and more. For me, I don't submit more and more. I have my 48 tracks. I'm good on that. I'm doing other stuff now, but they keep, you know, every year I'll get one or two new licensing deals that start the income streams again. So licensing is a beautiful way to leverage the work you're doing and put it up on multiple platforms. Next, guest appearances. I mean, again, everybody's talking about this. Podcasts, guest blogging, guest workshops, um, going live on other people's YouTube channels, all that sort of stuff. So as I said earlier, podcasts aren't the most effective ways. They're great relationship builder if you're looking to build a relationship with the host and their audience. But I wouldn't you know, necessarily recommend trying to book 50 podcasts. I would suggest booking 50 uh, signature workshops for yourself and then 
using the podcast after they say yes to your signature workshop, say, great, do you want to have me on your podcast before we do the signature workshop? And that's a way more effective strategy if you're going to do podcasts. Uh, are we stuck? Can you see we're on guest appearance right now? Okay, cool. Now you can see profit sharing. Awesome. Thanks for uh, letting me know that it wasn't shifting. So profit sharing is uh, another beautiful way of doing your work. And here's, here's a few ways that can work. So Magic Kids, my son and I started a publishing company a couple of years ago called Magic Kids. Uh, we're gearing up to launch the Magic Kids app. Magic Kids app will be like Spotify for kids. We're producing the most magical audio stories on the planet. We've got about a thousand kids songs from musicians around the world that we've licensed. We've got a meditation library for kids that we've licensed. Every story comes with curriculum so that kids who homeschool or teachers that want to use it in a classroom setting can help kids integrate the lessons and themes. So we pay our authors, our voice actors, our musicians, our meditation guys, they get a small upfront bonus payment when we license a piece of content or we license a story, but then they get royalties. So we're the first ever fair pay publishing company, which basically means 50% of the revenue we generate from app subscriptions and book sales goes into an artist pool. And that money is split up amongst all of our artists that are contributing based on the number of subscribers and the number of engagements with their specific content inside of the app. That's a profit sharing thing. What I do on the apps, some of them are profit sharing. So you know, I get paid based on how many subscribers they have in the app and how many people are actually listening with, to my content. Profit sharing is a beautiful way to go. It can also look a little bit different. You could do, you know, a, a workshop, you and two other friends who all have complementary skill sets. You could basically all do a workshop together for a weekend and then split the profits that you make. Uh, it's a beautiful way to leverage relationships and leverage other people's creativity and work. And what we're trying to do at Magic Kids is we want to get the artist paid well because Spotify does not focus on paying the artist well. We're trying to build a platform that pays artists well to keep making art for kids. Next is collaboration. So this is a little bit different. I would not have the company I have right now, Magic Media, if it was not for collaborations. Uh, I'm not technical by nature. I'm not necessarily the best designer. I'm okay now because I've been doing it so many years. But what I've built a beautiful brand and a beautiful business, and we've done a lot of really cool projects because I have collaborated with people who are way better than me at videography, editing, design, tech, etc. And so my entire magic media model has been based on collaborations. So, for example, years ago when we were building that Grady Course Adventure training, and we were, you know, it was it was a nine month production. To, to produce this course. It's a beast. Uh, we had to build a custom platform full of like, you know, all the gamification elements that we wanted. It was all custom. It was beautiful. And uh, I couldn't afford to hire my buddies to come do the work. So I said, let's all, let's all split the revenue we make. So we built something that could not have been made had we not all worked together. And that's been kind of the foundation of how I've grown Magic Media is by find, finding a project or an idea and then pulling in the right collaborators and making it so that everybody feels like they got a stake in the reward that we're all going to get should this thing succeed. It's a beautiful way to work. And this actually is what shifted my entire uh, business model away from doing client work at Magic Media. We don't do client work anymore. A bunch of years ago, probably five years ago, um, I just finished a six-month production project on this like epic online course we built for a client. I think they paid us like... Forty or fifty thousand dollars for this project, and I was exhausted. It didn't matter how much money we made; it was just exhausting when we got it done. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And then, several days later, we had a, a person who came, and she, her membership was ready to blow up. and And so we created a partnership where we built her a new platform. We helped her relaunch her strategy and her, her, her membership, her brand, an online community to bring pull all of her assets into one thing so she wasn't selling all these other things. And it was a three-year revenue share. She paid us a down payment and then we shared the revenue for the next three years. And this has been the foundation for everything we do at Magic Media now on a partnership perspective is 
Um, I can be hired on an hourly basis for coaching, but if people want to work with my team and I at Magic Media and receive all of the expertise that we have and the creative gifts that we have to offer, then it's you pay a, a retainer and then we revenue share. And usually the, the terms are about three years for each of those so that we can go through an incredible growth process together. Um, so for you, you know, if you do client work, maybe you could try and experiment. Instead of doing client work, you do a rev share where they pay less money up front but should you all kick ass together, everybody wins with a reward at the end of it. And that's been a really fulfilling way. And, you know, I'll say not all partnerships go as planned. Not all partnerships end up crushing it out of the gate. Some of them, you know, some might not work out. And that's just a part of the game you play as an entrepreneur is you take a risk. If there's something you really believe in and you want to get involved in, then you try it and hopefully it goes well. And at the very least, you get new assets, you get new case studies and you move on and you keep doing it. Next, affiliate marketing. Uh, a lot of people are familiar with affiliate marketing. A lot of people don't do affiliate marketing. Affiliate marketing is really great. I mean, uh, we're starting a training tomorrow uh, called uh, Craft and Tour Your Signature Workshop. And, uh, you know, I know for sure we've sold at least 10 of our spots so far through a uh, friend promoting it to his audience. So that is a great way. Affiliate marketing is basically you have a product. You ask your network, people, friends, colleagues, peers, hey, will you promote this? If you promote this, I'll give you a percentage of the sales. So my percentages, I usually do. I'm like, sometimes you see people paying up to 50%. I don't do that. I pay 20 to 30% on affiliates. And instead of giving Mark Zuckerberg my money for ads, I'm just giving the, that money to my friends and it feels a lot better. I'd rather my friends get that money than Mark Zuckerberg and Meta. So Affiliate marketing is great. We use a, a platform called Thrivecart. It's $500 one-time payment. You can set up as many products as you want in there, subscriptions, et cetera. There's a whole affiliate management thing. And the thing is, if you're going to do affiliates, you just got to be kind of organized. You want to have you know, five promotional emails pre-written. You want to have five to 10 social media posts pre-written. You want to have a bunch of... Um, a bunch of banner images, square and rectangular already ready to go so that when they go to Thrivecart and they sign up to be an affiliate or whatever platform you use, that then you send them that to that folder where all of the resources are. And then you just check in with them, you know, once every couple of weeks as you're leading up to the launch to make sure they're ready to go if they have any questions and you just make it as easy as possible for these people to promote you so they can essentially copy and paste and edit a little bit if they want. Affiliate marketing is very effective. I highly recommend it. And just if you're going to do it, you want to be, you know, have a few months lead way where you're prepared and you got everything ready to go so that people have enough time to fit you into their promotional schedule. Next is sponsorships. This is new territory that we're crossing with Magic Kids is finding story sponsors for the app. Uh, this is a great way to create partnerships. If you do live events, uh, you can find sponsors to provide the food or, you know, to give money or give away free swag to people. If you do live streaming events and you're able to pull in a decent enough size crowd, and I have a buddy who has a, a podcast, he doesn't like have a huge audience, but he got a, I can't remember the live streaming company, but they sent him a bunch of gear and they paid him $10,000 to be the sponsor for a bunch of episodes. Sponsors are a great way to go. If you've got, you know, if you can guarantee you're going to get couple hundred, few hundred, 500 people watching each thing that you put out, chances are you can get some sponsors that'll, that'll work with you. Uh, next is YouTube shorts. So I personally, everybody has their own preference. I don't consider YouTube to be uh, social media. YouTube for me is entertainment and education. And so and other people's raise their eyebrows like, oh, YouTube's totally social media. Yeah, YouTube's kind of this other beast. Uh, it's highly addictive, but it's not social media to me. Um, and so YouTube shorts is interesting because, um, YouTube is trying to keep up with, uh, with TikTok right now. And so they're basically rewarding YouTube shorts, which are under 60 second YouTube videos, uh, magic kids. So this is one caveat to this workshop is magic kids is, uh, we're producing, we just produced 30 comedy commercials that we'll be releasing over the course of 30 days. Uh, these will be on social media and we will be using a very large budget. As I said earlier, 
you got to have a budget if you're going to do the social media game. And we'll be, you know, pouring $150,000 into ads to build a very big audience quickly through this ads campaign. Um, these ads are fun. We're working with one of the biggest, best comedy commercial companies in the world. Like this is a, this is a big investment that we're doing. I'm not going to be the one on social media running these campaigns. And I'll just give you an idea. So comedy is a interesting thing. I, I'm teaching a comedy course in, uh, in October where you're going to produce your own, write and produce your own comedy commercial. And so we've had a team of five of us. We're working with the team of comedians at the Harmon Brothers. Harmon Brothers produced a commercial squatty potty with the unicorn that poops out rainbows for the poop stools, the poop pourri. They have a whole bunch of like really iconic commercials. They've generated almost 2 billion views, almost a billion dollars in revenue through their, through their ads. So this is the team that we approach. We're like, if we want to do this, we want to do it right. Um, and so I'll just give you like a quick idea. And then I'm going to talk about comedy really quick and just how comedy can be a, uh, a re leverageable uh, thing that you can use. So I think I got the audio on. Here's one of our ads. This is called Screen Zombies. Hurry! Hurry! Oh, I'm stuck! Go on without me! Ah, I'm sorry! I'm sorry! Screen, screen Zombies! Hey, welcome to Magic Kids. This week's story is called The Other Side. Yay! Magic Kids, audio stories, music, and imagination meditations. And fun activities, too! If you're tired of battling screen zombies with your family, download the Magic Kids app today. Screens! So that was my son in the video. So that one was interesting. You know, if you're going to do comedy and this was a, this was just a little saying I wrote while doing some copywriting. Um, if you make people smile, they'll stay with you a while, but if you make them laugh till they cry, they'll pull out their wallet and buy. And this is the case. I mean, if you think about some of the most iconic comedy commercials, you see them on your social media. If you're on social media, you'll see them on YouTube. They make for very compelling cases. And so this one, we were trying to come up with an idea that happens as a parent when you introduce screens to kids. When you go to shut the screen off, they turn into just crazy people. It's like a drug, drug addict and you take the drug away. And so we're like, what is that? Like, what is that energy? And so we came up with the whole concept of screen zombies. So we have a whole series of screen zombie videos, each one that are a little bit different. So in the, that was screen zombies too. And the third one, the kids realize their parents are actually screen zombies. And so they have to take their phones. They have to introduce them to Magic Kids app because there's a whole grown up mode section of the Magic Kids app. So we have 30 of these commercials. We have another 20 that are in writing and pre-production right now. And comedy commercials are going to be one of the ongoing ways that we're going to build our audience, that we're going to build a fan base, and that we're going to draw people to us. Because the wonderful thing about comedy versus just a regular ad or selfie video talking about a workshop is if you do the comedy right, people will share your advertisement for you because it's funny. And that's the whole, that's the whole goal. You can create a commercial that you know, you're paying for the traffic, but then you're also getting the side effect of everybody sharing it because they think it's hilarious and they can relate to the problem you're trying to solve. So if you're going to do, you know, if you're going to do YouTube shorts, comedy is a great way to go. Sketch comedy. I mean, I've done lots of sketch comedy stuff. We're going to be uploading a bunch of my old videos to my YouTube channel shortly because we're trying to consolidate all the things that I do. So I just wanted to do that one just as a, a way to um, inspire creativity. Creativity is the way to go. We got to uh, reimagine what is possible. And when you take back that 40 to 50 hours a month, you might have more time to make comedy videos or music videos. We've done music videos for marketing campaigns in the past as well uh, that are really fun. So here are just some other really quick ways that we have been going about growing Magic Kids, press releases, uh, 
engage with your local media, newspapers, magazines, like local is an amazing way to grow a global brand. You build like this core in your local area. That's how I grew my meditation business. And, and it was amazing. I just started really local selling retail stores. If you have a physical product, go find the local mom pop shops that are carrying things like you or grocery stores. You don't have to go for the big chains in order to grow what you're doing. Smaller is okay in the beginning. Markets and trade shows. So Magic Kids, we've sold the majority of our books at markets and trade shows. Uh, generosity marketing, be generous. Give your stuff away in the beginning. If you can afford to give stuff away, give it away and ask people to leave reviews for you. Uh, comedy videos, workshop tours. When I was teaching those 500 meditation workshops, uh, several times a year, I would pick a city. So let's say Edmonton, Canada, for example, in Alberta. Uh, I would go there and I would teach five or six intro workshops that would be these two hour workshops. People would pay 20 to $30. I would do five or six different yoga studios. And then at the end of the week, I would do a day long immersive workshop that would people would pay a couple hundred dollars for. At each of the intro workshops, we would get anywhere from 15 to 50 people that would come out and I would sell my audio meditation library. So it was a hundred dollar library at the time. Uh, actually it still is. And, uh, and I would give like a 40% off discount. So I would have 60 to 70% of the people leave that intro workshop and they would purchase my library. So I'd make the ticket sale, I'd make the upsell. And then at the, uh, the end of the week, I'd usually have 20 ish people come to my day long workshop. So that'd be an extra chunk of money that would come in. So workshop tours are great. People love when new people come to their city or their yoga studio to teach them something. So uh, think about, you know, you could do a trial in your own, if you have a city that's close by, try and do three workshops in a week and see if you can fill those up. And if, because the yoga studios will promote you to their email list, they'll hang up posters for you. They'll probably keep 30% of the, the ticket sales that you make. And it's just a great way to collaborate. And it's fun. It gets you to go have a tour in another place, uh, contest with your audience and then find local partners. So I'm going to be doing a series here on Salt Spring Island, our little island this winter, uh, partnering with one of our local restaurants. So there's lots of creative ways. None of these require you to be on social media. Now for the magic formula. Are you wasting your time, your talent, your creativity, your life on social media? So uh, the question here is, uh, how much money do you make from social media? Write it down. Let's just pretend it's $1,000. How many hours do you spend on social media per month? So let's just say you make $1,000 and you're spending 50 hours a month, which is almost the average of, of people who come to this. So if that was the case, you're, you're making 1000 bucks of direct revenue from social media, you're spending 50 hours a month posting, commenting, liking, sharing, scrolling, et cetera, creating content for it. That's 20 bucks an hour. If that's all you're getting from your social media time, then you're wasting your time. You know, are you making at least $100 an hour for every hour invested into social media? You know, is it like a solo creator or somebody with a small team? That should be kind of the, the benchmark of like your expectation because, you know, you're going to charge hundred, several hundred dollars for whatever it is that you do per hour. You should be expecting a return on your time, you know, valuing your time on social media. So do the math. If the numbers don't make sense, um, I would suggest picking some of the, the one or two or three top strategies today and, and reimagine what is possible for you and your business. So social media can work. I'm not telling anybody to quit social media today. I, I'm just saying you need a clear strategy. If the strategy is post and hope, you need to get clearer than that. Have a publishing schedule. So, you know, do you post three times a week? Do you post five times a week? Can you batch all that? Can you use one of those services that allow you to just post on all the things so you don't even have to log into those accounts and go see what's up? Be disciplined. So, you know, have one hour a day where you go in and comment and share and post and then log yourself out and get out of there. Don't go checking again. Hire a team if you can. That's what we're doing with the Harmon Brothers is... We have a team of professionals that know how to get results and make your work art. So if you can 
find, marry that inner entrepreneur and that inner artist. That's when your work is going to pop. That's when people will see your uniqueness shine through is when your work can be art. And that's when things get fun. And chances are in order for your work to be art, you need to take your time back. You need to find a way to reclaim an extra 20 or 40 hours a month so that you can make more art in your life and then share that art with your people. And it's going to get you better results. We use Mighty Networks. So if you're looking for a platform, you can build your own social media network on Mighty Networks. This is what we use for a lot of our partnerships and, and projects. So inside of Mighty Networks, you can have community. You can have it be like a blog. You can do live streaming. You can sell workshops, courses, trainings. You can do everything that you want to do between a blog and a social network. You can segment it into as many groups as you want to go. Uh, we use Mighty Networks for our team management space as well. It's way better than something like Slack. Um, and so that's where our team manages all of our projects and does all of our team communications. Mighty Networks is great. If you haven't checked it out, it might be something you want to take a peek at and reach out if you have questions. So final, final words is uh, give yourself the gift and reevaluate your marketing strategy. Uh, decide if social is working for your business or not. Maybe take a th three month experiment of like really cutting it back a lot if it's not working for you. And I would suggest, you know, grab your journal and spend a half a day at least to a day contemplating these things and do it while it's fresh. Like this weekend, book three, five, three to five hours to like really reevaluate your marketing and see what inspiration strikes and what you could change. And leave social media if you must and protect your time and consciousness. It feels like there's a war on our consciousness right now. And it's really important that we stay connected to what matters to us, that we stay inspired and connected to love and fun and creativity and art and real world connections. Because it's those real world connections that are going to be the ones we look to when shit hits the fan. So really like reevaluate things if it's not working for you. Um, those of you, I have this training coming up. It starts tomorrow. Uh, and this goes till November 9th, craft and tour your signature workshop. So in it, you're going to craft a transformational signature workshop, similar to what we just did here. You're going to take that signature workshop on tour. You're going to get all my templates uh, for email outreach, for setting up those affiliate programs, for website templates, et cetera, to onboard people. You're going to get the whole thing of like how I tour this and scale it. And then you're going to grow your audience impact and income. You're going to save time. You're going to start seeing immediate results. You're literally going to deliver your first signature workshop while the training's on in the last week of October, first week of November. And chances are you get really inspired about your marketing strategy because you go into 2024 and you'll be like, okay, I'm going to do 50 signature workshops this year. If you do 50 signature workshops this year, your audience is going to grow by thousands of people and you're going to make thousands more dollars. I can just, it's true. <laughs> and uh, surround yourself with awesome people throughout this process. Uh, you can get all the details. It's 500 bucks or two payments at 247 per month. If you go the magic mind route, which is my, my membership, um, you should check it out if this has resonated and you feel like you could create a really cool signature workshop that would be kind of that entry point for a new audience to discover you, your work and what you're here to do in the world. Please share this on social media. Cause I can't. It'd be really helpful if you pass this around. <laughs> and uh, that's all, folks. We can now go into some q and If there's any questions, uh, we got like, you know, 10 minutes for some questions. So hopefully, I would love to know, you know, what is one or two of the main ideas that stuck out the most for you? Um, was there anything that really stuck out? So Jonathan asks, any advice on big cities? I'm taking your, uh, you're talking about like the workshop tours. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, yeah. And just like local, you, you know, you talked about local um, advertising and local papers and stuff. New York, obviously, is it seems like there's only big, uh, big outlets, but um, any advice around that would be helpful. Yeah. I mean, one of the, the best things to do would be like finding a lot finding some neighborhoods that you really dig the vibe of. And going to those neighborhoods or, or doing some research ahead of time and like finding the creative spaces, the hubs, the studios, et cetera, 
that you vibe with and spend an afternoon and just go in in person, have like a little poster that you can leave them, introduce yourself, ask to speak to a manager. And like, it's really amazing. Like we're this day and age, people are so shy about like actually meeting people behind my email. I'll send an email, but what I've had to learn is like, I, I pick up the phone and call people or I'll show up in person. I've had to do this with magic kids with selling our books in the stores. It's just like, just show up and be like, Hey, I'm here. You can't avoid me now. You can't ignore my email and just like go pitch yourself and, and share your vision of what you want to offer and, and who you are and what you do. And then, you know, at, if they're not available in that moment, ask like, who's the best person to connect with? I want to, I have want to pitch an idea. I have, I would just say that, you know, you could probably, if you predetermine the studios you want to do, kind of mapped out a little route, you could probably hit up, you know, 10 studios in an afternoon and go make some connections and relationships. And chances are people will be delighted. You know, if you get three or four out of 10 that say they'd love to host you in the coming months, that's great. You're building your business. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, when you're in a big city, local means neighborhood, you know, like a, a five to 10 block radius is the local, local place for that. If you're in like a smaller town, like where, where we live on Salt Spring Island, local is the entire island. So really dependent on where you are. And so if you're going local and you're looking for neighborhoods, find the neighborhood neighborhoods you really vibe with. Um, Okay, Maggie says, how do you start when you don't have a mailing list and your network or people in the same boat as yourself, not into marketing to promote your workshop and services worldwide? It's a great question. I mean, if you did tour a signature workshop, nobody's going to ask you how big your email list is. You just got to have something that is worth people hosting you for. What a host is looking for, the reason somebody would host you for a signature workshop is that you have something complimentary that their audience is going to want it. They, the work that they're doing with their audience and your work is complimentary and you're creating a connection point of like, I see what you're doing and I have something that would really benefit your audience. If you, they're just wanting to look good. Like anybody with an email list, they want to provide value for their audience so that their audience sticks around for a long time. And so if you pitch them on a workshop that makes them look good, that provides value for their audience, they're going to be stoked. And if they end up getting an affiliate fee, they'll be cool with that too. So I would say signature workshop is a great way. Uh, number two, you need an email list. So go get on Substack today. Substack is like, it's a great place to grow an organic audience. Um, you know, you can do a newsletter, a blog, all sorts of stuff. You can run a podcast through it. Uh, I would say binge an hour worth of Substack how-to videos, like tonight when you're bored or, you know, you're scrolling Facebook, go over to Substack because um, you can grow your email list. You can do podcasting, you can do blogging. They also have a new section of Substack, which is similar to like a Twitter feed where you can start to organically post and, and build a following. And you can also start to send people of like, go to my Substack. I post once a week and you can monetize your Substack. So a lot of people are starting to monetize their newsletters. People can pitch in five or 10 bucks a month to get your newsletter. And you can also make that optional on Substack. So you could have at the bottom of every email of like, you love my work, want to support me, want to inspire me to keep doing this. Give me 10 bucks a month. And so that would be a starting point. But to tour a signature workshop, it doesn't matter if you have an email list. And if you're hanging out with friends that aren't into marketing, you might want to hang out with some friends that are going to inspire you to start marketing. Because honestly, the field of dreams thing of if you build it, they will come is a lie. They won't show up. You do have to market. You got to become, in the beginning, you have to be your own fan, your own PR person. You got to put yourself out there. And it's really uncomfortable. It's, it does suck in the beginning. That's why, you know, the whole idea behind a signature workshop is you're just trying to show up and be yourself. You know, it's like, can I come teach this thing? You know, most of us, all we want to do is get in front of a group of people and change some lives. And the signature workshop is the most direct way to do that. All you're doing is saying, can I come and cha change your audience's lives? Here's what it's going to be about. Here's the results they're going to walk away with. And that's why it's so easy. You know, like last week, Coralie, um, she said, I, I, I think Coralie, you sent out uh, somewhere between 50 and 100 emails. And we've probably had about 10 people respond and want to host our signature workshop coming up this fall. 
So that's like, I've done 12 already in the last year. That's grown my email list by about 3000 people. And this fall, I already have about 10 that are going to be booked. So you do the math. I show up, that's 10 hours of teaching time. So it's really cool. I, I would just highly suggest you work it into your, your game plan. If you have questions about it, I mean, reach out to me after this session. I'm happy to, uh, happy to support with that. Awesome. Welcome, Jonathan. Stoked to take you on the journey. It's going to be fun. And there's the link for anybody else that wants to check it out that didn't catch it earlier. Uh, are there any other questions? If anybody asked a question earlier and you want to post it back up at the top, please do. Um, just looking through the chat. Hey, Brad. Yeah. Would you say that Substack would be good for a business email list? Or no? Yeah. Yeah, I, I do. I think it would be great, you know, for what you're doing with building your audience uh, around wing foiling, wing foiling events and retreats and sponsors and information and planning trips and all the things. I mean, it's, it's just a really simple platform that you can use that it's just, it's all right there. You know, you could start interviewing people for a podcast It's really easy to set up the podcast functionality. You could have articles, you could do trip reviews, all that sort of stuff could happen inside a Substack. You can brand it. The branding stuff is pretty simple. You know, it's not as good as a custom website, but you can still do some really simple things. We haven't announced my Substack yet, but we've been building. So I'm moving my blog from WordPress to Substack. And this is just like a, we're going to do a six month uh, experiment with my Substack and see how it goes. So we've kind of got my, my blog more hidden on my website now. But there's the Substack that I have. And, you know, this didn't take a lot of time for us to set up and start importing. If you have um, if you have a podcast already up on Apple or Spotify or any of those, you can actually import your, your whole podcast into Substack really quick. So, yeah, it's, I mean, you know, if you need, it, it doesn't allow you to do like the affiliate stuff and all the tracking pieces that you would do and, you know, we use ConvertKit for my main email list where we do kind of all of our segmenting and stuff like that. But it is a great tool. And if you don't have an email list, and you don't have a blog and all that sort of stuff, I would say like, it's a great starting point to just get started today. And, you know, if you spent from 6 p.m. to midnight and you just dove into that world, you could have your stuff up by tomorrow. You know, like it's you could have the, the structure in place, which would be amazing. Any other questions? Yeah. yeah. Um, do you have any uh, training or do you do training on the idea of the, the licensing stuff is very uh, interesting to me and something I'd like to learn more about, whether it's from my own stuff or licensing other people's stuff. So, yeah. So we have um, inside the magic mind um, on this page, I have a whole training called um the business of meditation. One of the monthly modules is all about licensing. You have, it comes with a spreadsheet of over hundred different apps you can license to. You can, it comes with the email outreach templates. It comes with like all of the steps you need to take in order to license your stuff and be educated on like, how do you do licensing? What is non-exclusive versus exclusive mean? What are you looking to do in these, these partnerships? And then uh, once you get your library ready to go, you can start to email out. We had one uh, client years ago and she produced a course. She did like corporate training stuff. And, you know, her fees would be seven to $16,000 to do a training with a company. And it was not scalable. She was traveling the country all year round. And so companies were starting to ask her to make something online that was more accessible, et cetera. And so she... Um, we produced this course and I can't remember how much she made, but she created like an evergreen version. Her first corporate client paid her like $18,000 a year just to license the evergreen content from this course she did. So like, you know, there's companies like one of the, one of the first, what kind of got me on the path with licensing my content is my audio library was gaining in popularity. And, uh, and then I had this company called Mequilibrium reach out to me and they do like, corporate wellness trainings and app and all that sort of stuff. And I'm like, could you 
produce 10 custom meditations under 10 minutes. And I was like, sure. And I, you know, it was my first time ever negotiating. This was, it must've been like seven or eight years ago. It was around the time my son was born. And uh, so I think I charged something like $2,500 per track. Um, so that's 25 grand per track. Plus on top of that, a $750 per track licensing fee per year or or no, maybe it was, it was a thousand dollars per year. Yeah. It was a thousand dollars per year. And so I've been getting these licensing checks every October, those checks come in for 11,000, $12,000 and, uh, every year, plus that initial fee. It was awesome. And it still is awesome. I look forward to those checks every year. That's my wellness check that comes in that I invest into body care and, and all the, all the things, buying a giant order of food for our freezers and pantries and all that sort of stuff. It's like our stock up fee that comes in every year. And so uh, licensing is really beautiful. I would just say like, when you're reaching out to a licensing partner, you know, you, the, and this is taught in that course, but like, keep the intro emails really simple. Show them a couple samples of your best work that you have. Brag about yourself a little bit and what you've done. And, uh, and just look to book the conversation with them. Um, you know, the, my, my buddy who does investment for the last 30 years is like, just sell them on the conversation and then sell them in the conversation. Once you've booked that. That's the business of meditation course. That's right. Yeah. Got it. Now, is that included when you do the, when you sign up for the monthly sort of membership? Yeah. When you're in the magic mind, you get all the courses you see on that magic mind page uh, are included. So that's, you know, you could sign up for the magic mind for a month and you could just go into that course today and just go to that module and download all this stuff and take advantage of my brain while you're in there to ask me questions and share your email outreach once you've gone through the templates and all the things. So anybody that goes into the magic minds, like we're active in there. If you're sharing your stuff and you're asking for feedback, I'm going to support you. I'll start with the uh, signature workshop and then we'll, we'll Fun. Take it from there. Yeah. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, any other questions before we part ways for the day? And uh, anybody want to share what's, what's one thing you're going to change with your marketing strategy? What's the first step? Aside from digest this giant blah that I just threw at you. <laughs> Substack. I'm going to go into Substack and do that. Nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Substack's a really cool platform and it's easy to use. Brad, I liked your idea to, um, to batch the social media time and like go in with a specific intention and come out. Yeah, we do. Uh, in the magic mind, we have like Monday planning sessions. So every Monday at 930, we have a session where everybody just comes and plans out their week. So that those types of things of like, what is the content I'm going to create? What's my newsletter this week? What are my social media posts that I'm going to do? And then in that 60 minute session, you can just like have your week mapped out, you can start to block off times in your calendar that are still open so that you have space to do all those things. Um, I often do that on my Sundays, but then we do the, the live session on Mondays and it's, it's a great way to go if you, so that you're not just kind of floating through the week and reacting to things that you can be really intentional with those time blocks that you have available. I think, uh, for me, it's more, um, a, a mindset shift. Yeah. Because I think I've been like so, so worried about, you know, credibility and those kind of things. And I feel like, you know, people with a hundred, well, a hundred thousand followers are the people that other people will choose to be on podcasts or, you know, whatever else. Um, and so <laughs> I always just thought, well, that's not, I don't have that. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't have that credibility. So maybe yeah. it would be difficult for me to, to sell any kind of workshop to anybody. Um, so yeah, Which, I guess I just, I'm just going to go for it. <laughs> mindset shift. Uh, so those are vanity metrics. Some people are concerned about those vanity metrics. Those people are vain. <laughs> They're not actually <laughs> looking at what it is that you're doing or what value you can provide. All they're looking at are those metrics. So those people, not your people, but what you can do is like, you know, there's, if there's somebody who only has an email list to 200 people, 
chances are that person who has 200 people on their email list probably gets a really high open rate because they've built a lot of trust with those, that small group of people. You know, if there's 200 people get emailed about your workshop that you're doing and you get 20 people show up and two or three of those people end up buying something that you're selling. And then again, the next week you have an email list of 500 people and you get five or 10 people show up to your thing and a couple buy like all you're looking for is like, this is a long-term journey. You're climbing a big mountain here. You don't have to have people that have 50,000 people on their email list to promote your stuff in order to build your lifestyle that you want. Like you do it one small workshop at a time. That's how I built my meditation business. It wasn't like 500 people coming out to my meditation workshops. It was literally anywhere between two and 20 people per workshop. Sometimes we'd have a room of 50 if I was like doing my meditation tours to other cities. But oftentimes it was like 10 to 15 on average. And you can, you can build something beautiful if it's just 10 to 15 people per time. And eventually as momentum kicks in and maturity kicks in, because you know, we're all maturing as we grow as entrepreneurs and creators. And, you know, this is a, this is a long game. And the most important thing that I learned while doing the meditations is consistency is the key to building trust and building something that lasts a long time. And so if you're trying to teach a workshop, if your goal, you know, for 2024 is I'm going to teach a signature workshop once every two weeks, that's 25 signature workshops in a year. That's, that's a lot of teaching. That's going to be amazing. So the way that I do it is like, I'm trying to book, you know, at least a couple for other people's audiences every month. And then I do one every month for my own email list. So that when people come to my email list and that little pop-up thing happens, it's like, join the next signature workshop training. And doing something like that for yourself is like, you know, you can just keep stoking that fire, keep giving people a reason to opt into your thing. And the whole goal of a signature workshop is you just keep improving it every single time that you do it. And if you can just keep improving, then your work's going to keep getting better and reputation will spread. And at the end of doing a signature workshop for somebody's audience, always ask them, do you have any recommendations on one or two people I should reach out to that I should go teach this workshop to? And they'll probably say, oh yeah, you should check in with so-and-so and be like, are you comfortable making an intro? And then they'll be like, oh yeah, of course I'll make an intro. And then you follow up and say, hey, could you introduce me to so-and-so? And you just build it that way. Because then if you can name drop them or if they introduce you, chances are way better that you're going to get a response. And you just grow it that way. Do that, you know, like you can spend, you could fill up a spreadsheet with a hundred potential people to pitch on doing a social, on a, doing your signature workshop. Like that might take you five or six hours of research to find at least a hundred names that you could reach out to, to pitch your signature workshop to. So that's like what, two days of social media time for most people. <laughs> it's, uh, you replace that two days and then, you know, you work on those pitch emails and everything and, and you start to refine it and your first version of your signature workshop won't be the best. That's why you do it to your own audience. You say, hey, I've got this idea. I'm going to teach this thing. It's free. Come out. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, I know we are past the time. Uh, unless there's one more thing, let's part ways. Uh, check out the page. Our first session is tomorrow. And um, this video will be up on YouTube if anybody wants to come back to it. And my YouTube channel is youtube.com slash magicmedia, M-A-J-I-K, media.com or media. <laughs>